Hello and welcome. My name is Robert and I am joined by Jen and Glenn. And today our masterclass will be securing the supply chain infrastructure. And these are my esteemed colleagues and I'm blessed to have them here. Jen, would you like to do a quick introduction of yourself? Sure. Good morning. My name is Jen Justison and I am the product manager for risk management and compliance for the Rancher portfolio. Hi, everyone. I'm Glenn Kosaka, and I'm head of product security for SUSE. As we kick this off, we are using a platform called Crowdcast. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, you will see a few things. Um, one is ask question. Feel free to ask your questions there. I'll ask Glenn or answer it myself or Jen the question. Uh, feel free to ask at any time. Um, there is a chat say something nice um if you feel comfortable telling us where you're from please you know give us a shout out where you're coming up um, and lastly this session is recorded so feel free to re come back later and watch it these are going to be on youtube later um, as soon as i do the cleanup and put post-production on it and you will see it on the youtube channel under red your labs okay. and i will get started <clears throat> Okay, ready for me to start, Robert? Yes, by all means. All right. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Glenn Kosaka. And so I'll be talking about uh, some big picture things about supply chain security. And then Jen will cover uh, specifically a broader um, view of what si supply chain security is and how SUSE and our products uh, partake in, in supply chain security. And then I'll come back and I'll talk about our specific, one of our specific solutions, uh, the New Vector product, which uh, helps to enforce the containerized supply chain. So once uh, your container images are entering your pipeline and trying to get into the production environment, uh, what that, you know, what, what security entails. Uh, and then Robert will talk about another SUSE solution called Kuborden and uh, what, how that can help. And then we'll come back and we'll take some questions. So, you know, the, really the big picture context is we know that everyone's getting ready to push containers into production. Uh, before you do that, the first thing we need to make sure about is uh, what are the, you know, are these, um, containers and all of the open source components that are being used, including SUSE products, uh, are they uh, going through a secure supply chain uh, process so that uh, backdoors or other tainted images can't be introduced into the pipeline? Um, we need to make sure that we have container specific uh, and cloud native tools uh, because traditional tools don't work in a containerized environment, whether that's in the pipeline for image scanning or whether that's during runtime uh, when you're actually running your Kubernetes workloads. So uh, it's critical to, to look at new cloud native security technologies. <clears throat> uh, next slide, Robert. <clears throat> So uh, now once we have taken a look at some of the supply chain issues of the source of our images, our images are going to uh, enter the, the CI CD pipeline. And this is where this is the uh, dev to build process. Typically images have to be scanned in the build phase. Uh, and then uh, as they sit in registries and move through QA all the way into production, uh, that needs to be continuously monitored. So really the importance of the container supply chain is really that vulnerabilities can enter the pipeline or new vulnerabilities can be disclosed or discovered at any point that uh, your images are in this pipeline, even all the way into production. Uh, we also have to make sure that everything is monitored properly, RBAC controls, access controls for registries, uh, which would be in the pipeline, but as well as in production, Kubernetes and your container hosts uh, also can be misconfigured, so that can present an attack surface. And then once we're in the production environment, there are 
uh, in addition to the traditional application workloads, which can be attacked, there are also new attack services, Kubernetes itself, uh, whatever runtime that's being used or service mesh, any of the tools that are being used to manage the production environment can present an attack surface. So today we'll be focusing, I would say on the left side of this, um, but I do want to mention that next week we will have a follow-on masterclass, which will focus on the production side, which is the runtime side of security. <clears throat> next, please. All right, and this is Jen. I'm going to be taking over and give you just a very basic background of um, supply chain attacks and implementing a secure supply chain. So for a background, um, most of us on the whole weren't really this keenly aware of supply chain attacks until the solar winds hack happened. Um, if you're not familiar with the solar winds hack, this was in December of 2020. Um, the malware was deployed as an update from SolarWinds servers and was actually digitally assigned. It didn't wind up affecting quite as many people as they thought, but it had the potential to affect nearly everyone who used Orion, which is public and private sector. So this timeline right here is from Anissa. And if you take a look, now this only goes through half of 2021, it's still being updated. But even after SolarWinds, there's still 17 fairly large new supply chain issues that have happened. So this, this, these keep happening. Uh, next slide, please. So not only is cybersecurity as a whole trying to address this problem, now there's another layer of urgency due to federal requirements. So in May of 2021, the Biden administration put out a memo to address improving the nation's cybersecurity as a whole. So this addressed not only removing barriers to sharing threat intelligence and incidents, um, it also speaks to modernizing federal cybersecurity, which is the zero trust approach. And the one that we're concerned with today is Section 4, it's Enhancing Software Supply Chain Security. This calls for, this is a call to action for papers, for suggestions, for working groups, but they require employing automated tools, providing an SBOM, and potentially a security labeling program as well. So granted, these are federal requirements. I know we think that <clears throat> unless you have a federal customer, you don't really care about it, but that's not entirely true. These federal requirements tend to trickle down into private sector customer requirements as well. Whether you work with the federal government or not, they tend to become standard cybersecurity practices. Think of NIST as the backbone. Next slide, please. So very basically, what, what constitutes a software supply chain? There's many definitions. If you Google it, you're going to come up with about 16 different ones in varying detail, but it boils down to anything that's going to affect your review, evaluation, production, or distribution of your product. This graphic comes from salsa.dev, and it shows you at every single step of this build process, there is a way that if it's not secured, somebody can get into your supply chain. Next. Now, there's quite a few papers and standards that have been released. Uh, CNCF has one. NIST has come out with one. There's also ISO 28001. Uh, the most comprehensive and easily attainable one is SALSA. That is the supply chain levels for software artifacts. And that's what SUSE is working on today, just as kind of an introduction to um, securing our supply chain. This is part of the OpenSSF Supply Chain Integrity Working Group, and it was um, created by Google. So this is led by a cross-organizational steering committee. This includes Google, VMware, Intel, Linux Foundation, et cetera. It's an incremental framework to achieve your supply chain integrity through realistic steps. There's no certifications at the moment. There's no audits yet. This is self-reported, but you can get a badge <laughs> if you are up to certain levels. Uh, the levels are built on um, certain controls. At the bottom, we have source, build, provenance, and common controls. Source involves um, version control. Are things verifiable? Did, did you retain the history? Is there two-person integrity? Build requires that it's a scripted and reproducible build. Provenance wants to make sure that the history is available and authenticated. And common controls involve access controls and security. Now, levels one through four, these are, um, level one is uh, 
excuse me, basic protection. So this is going to be unsigned provenance, but it's still there. Uh, thorough documentation of the build process. Level two, medium protection is tamper resistant build service. So a horse, hosted source build and signed provenance. Level three is further resistance. This is going to be security controls are in place and we have non-falsifiable provenance. And number four is the highest level to attain. That makes sure that you have two-party review and a completely hermetic build. And these levels are not transitive. Each artifact can have a separate rating. So it's a very it's a very in-depth process to fully comply with salsa. So for rancher, we currently have a Oh, that's okay. So Rancher, we currently have a, a proof of concept in the works. Right now we're working on improvements to the build service and for provenance. And on the Linux side of the house, um, there's been a gap assessment done, but they're very close to level four because of their common criteria EAL4 plus certification and build requirements. So this last slide, the bigger picture, if you take a look, the, the very hefty requirements of supply chain are only a teeny tiny part of this zero trust pillars and capabilities graphic right here. Um, and Glenn, I'm going to turn it over to you to keep going on this topic. Awesome. So thank you for that uh, overview of uh, supply chain. <clears throat> Again, that's just OK. So um, now we're going to talk about you know, getting more into the containerized environment and what does it take? What is supply chain security? And I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent here on zero trust as well, since Jen, you brought it up. <laughs> Might as well give the viewers a little bit more insight into zero trust as well. But uh, one way to look at it is you've got a secure su uh, supply chain. Um, that's really going to make sure that nothing bad, unauthorized, vulnerable, or that uh, violates your compliance requirements uh, gets into the runtime environment. Uh, I'll also cover admission controls because to me that is the key gate uh, between your uh, supply chain and the runtime environment. So it's really the last chance for you to prevent um, bad stuff from getting into that environment. But don't forget, uh, equally important, and some may argue more important, is runtime security. When you're going to have uh, hackers uh, trying to get into your environment, they're going to use all kinds of uh, methods to get in, not just trying to exploit vulnerabilities. And uh, so you need to be able to detect and, and block uh, potential attacks and exploits, or if they try to expand the blast radius to, to prevent an attack from expanding. Next, please. <clears throat> so as um, Jen introduced, um, in, in, this is it in a different form, which is the seven pillars of a zero trust strategy. So first of all, let me give a little bit of background in case you're wondering what's, you know, supply chain is a hot topic these days. Zero trust is another hot topic you're probably hearing about in the security industry. What do those have to do with each other and what do they really mean and how do they relate? Uh, the way I look at it is they're kind of two different ways of looking at security issues. So for example, Jen talked about um, the need to uh, log all the activities in your supply chain. Uh, user access controls are critical to any of the tools in the supply chain, including all the way into the registries. Who's allowed to put things into the registries? Uh, so users are a critical aspect. And IAM, uh, those types of uh, two-factor authentication, all of those issues are critical to have um, uh, the, the right approach, um, a zero trust approach, which is essentially defining who's allowed to access these things or what's allowed, what activity is allowed. And so the seven pillars, we start with users. Um, typically, we would then uh, look at any devices that people are using or systems that are used. We'll go around clockwise the network. Um, do we know who has access to the network or network environment? Um, can we see the actual applications and the workloads? And combined with the network, can we make sure that the application, uh, whether it's connections externally or internally, are um, clearly defined as to what behavior are, is allowed? Uh, and then finally, the last, uh, or sorry, the last two elements uh, on this clock are visibility and analytics. Can we see what's going on in the environment? 
Uh, remember I said that at the beginning that Kubernetes um, abstracts the network layer and uh, your traditional tools are kind of blind in that Kubernetes container environment. And then uh, automation and orchestration. We need to make sure to support modern CICD pipelines and to avoid configuration errors that could open up um, security attack surfaces that we heavily use uh, automation and orchestration tools. And in the center of our uh, seven pillars is the most important thing that companies are trying to protect is, is really the data, sensitive data. Uh, are we making sure that it's encrypted and that we're monitoring any communication of data that it needs, whether it's data at rest or data in motion? Uh, do we have tools in place to detect if sensitive data is being sent around unencrypted or if they're being siphoned off through using a DNS tunnel or other sneaky network means? So those are all the pillars of the Zero Trust uh, strategy. Um, actually, uh, we did a, um, a meetup uh, or webinar last or two weeks ago. Uh, so there's a recording on YouTube that you can access about uh, what is zero trust. So we, we uh, can go into more detail if you look at the recording there. Next, please. <clears throat> so. Um, it's a lot to swallow, I can imagine. Uh, you're thinking that's a lot of stuff we got to take care of. Supply chain, zero trust, all the seven pillars, uh, take it in phases, right? Our, our big advice is um, make sure, first of all, your user uh, access controls, you clearly define who has access to what, two-factor authentication, role-based access controls are in place to the extent that any of the um, tools being used in the supply chain um, can can uh, accommodate that. And secondly, device and network, we talked about uh, third pipeline and workload. So we're going to focus on the pipeline today. And then in next week's uh, masterclass, we'll talk about the workload, how to secure the workload when it's running in production, and then also how to automate that security for the workloads and achieve compliance. Next. <clears throat> So uh, four major aspects that we want to highlight when it comes to zero trust, and all of these can help to protect your uh, pipeline. The first, is, the first is to minimize the attack surface. So make sure that vulnerabilities can't get in, make sure that it's a kind of a allow list uh, based approach rather than uh, a block list so that everything uh, is clear to define what behavior is allowed. Uh, conduct the real-time enforcement for the production environments, monitor that continuously, and that's just not for production environments, even for access to, to registries or access to dev tools in the pipeline. Uh, continuous monitoring, continuous scanning uh, for compliance violations, uh, those can be caught very early in the pipeline and can prevent further problems down the road in production. And then uh, we talked about, you know, this needs to be easy to use and automated because in a modern cloud native environment, uh, uh, the pipeline um, workloads need to be able to be deployed and up, uh, updated um, hundreds of times a day. So you can't have manual steps in that pipeline. Next. <clears throat> So Jen uh, alluded to uh, the SUSE products and, and how we uh, help to enforce um, security as well as supply chain. Uh, all of the uh, SUSE products participate in a secure supply chain. And in addition, these products help to help you to enforce a secure supply chain and a zero trust stack. So we have New Vector, which we'll talk about today and next week. Uh, Kube Warden as well is also a uh, very extensible, customizable gatekeeper to your uh, production environment. Rancher with the orchestration capability for those workloads is also playing a critical part in making sure that nothing bad gets into the environment and the deployment of your uh, Kubernetes environment as well as the workloads follow certain compliance uh, that you have set. Uh, SUSE Linux, Lee, uh, we, we 
uh, call it SLE or, or BCI is the hardened uh, reduced uh, attack surface image. Um, so those can uh, participate in, in reducing the attack surface. And Harvester is really the, um, the tool that can help to make sure that there's segmentation between virtual machines that are deployed at the OS level. And Longhorn is the storage solution. The way it can participate in this is to make sure that there's encryption of data at rest. So really, you should look for secure stacks, um, open uh, technologies, which can be used interchangeably, but together, which can help make sure that you're really deploying a completely secure infrastructure from the pipeline all the way into production. Next, please. <clears throat> So if we talk about New Vector, uh, New Vector is really providing that full lifecycle container security from pipeline to production. Uh, and it really starts in the build scanning phase. This is when you're building your images. Uh, I'll show you examples of this, uh, how you can trigger a scan. And then that should be continuously scanned once the images are in a registry. Uh, once you're starting to test and move into the production environments, CIS benchmarks and other custom auditing tools are critical to make sure that uh, your environment is set up and continuously audited for uh, configuration misconfigurations. And then finally, runtime scanning uh, of the container and the host and the platform is uh, equally in uh, important. Next. <clears throat> And as I mentioned, um, the, the, the gate to the runtime environment is really admission controls. So we'll talk about that extensively today, uh, but today we won't cover the other runtime, the real core runtime protection, which is gonna protect you against zero day attacks. That'll be the topic of next week's masterclass. And that's really looking at network segmentation, threat detection through a container firewall, monitoring those workloads uh, for process and file violations and activity, and then um, next slide shows how this needs to be automated into your pipeline as well. So next slide. <clears throat> yeah, so all of that really needs to su be supported uh, in a declarative environment where you can declare through security policy as a code and automate all of your runtime security policies. So that's a big picture overview. I'm gonna dive into the uh, build phase scanning now. Next, <clears throat> all right. So as I mentioned, um, this is really one of the first chances uh, for the dev and the DevOps teams to make sure that um, not only are vulnerabilities detected in the pipeline, but any uh, also any uh, other types of compliance violations. Uh, that could exist in the image. For example, secrets could exist uh, in the image. So uh, the typical best practice here is to dynamically trigger a scan in your build pipeline. Uh, and, and this is an example of a, a Jenkins pipeline, uh, but it can really be any pipeline, any tool, GitLab, uh, Azure DevOps, CircleCI, any tool that you're using at, at some point in that pipeline can then trigger the new vector scan. And you can uh, configure uh, it to fail the build and send it back to the developer under certain conditions. Uh, and that could be uh, as simple as, you know, specific CVEs you're looking for, like log4j, or it could be any uh, level of uh, a CVSS score uh, or critical medium rating of the vulnerabilities. Compliance violations could fail to build. <clears throat> and, uh, and you can even put things like only fail to build if there's a fix available because I need to, you know, there's a fix available and it's published more than seven days ago. There's plenty of time to have updated uh, our image in the dev process uh, to the fixed version. So that definitely needs to be failed and, and sent back uh, to be rebuilt using the uh, fixed uh, version. <clears throat> uh, so this needs to be integrated in the pipeline. Um, you can use all of the supported extensions and plugins, or you can also uh, just manually invoke the um, scanning activity 
you know, whether it's a Docker run of the scanner or, um, and then using the REST API to manually trigger the scan. Um, there are several models for invoking this supported. Uh, the first is a standalone scanner. This is essentially a container uh, that's in the new vector uh, image product line. And so you can simply invoke the scanner uh, in your build process, um, point it to the image that you want scanned. The results will come back into your build tool. You can uh, implement all the logic you want to allow or um, fail the build and then, and then stop the uh, scanner at that point. So it's kind of a dynamically um, invoked scanner. Another one is more a permanent model where you have a controller running permanently. It's got a scanner in it. And uh, perhaps you're invoking the scan through the controller. And maybe you're putting things in a temporary registry, like a build registry. And uh, then the controller will know to reach out there to scan that image from the registry. And then again, you can fail the build if it doesn't meet your security requirements. Next. So after uh, the build is allowed to pass into uh, the registry and to be stored there, per perhaps uh, a staging registry or even your production registry, this is where it's critical to have continuous scanning. So whether it's triggered on demand or whether it's, uh, you know, you're running a rescan of all of your images daily, uh, because there could be new CVEs discovered uh, in the last 24 hours, um, your images need to be continuously scanned. And uh, in the scanning, not only are we going to look for CVEs and vulnerabilities in all the packages and libraries and present that to you in a layered scan format. So we're going to show you which layer of the image contains those vulnerabilities. Uh, but we're also going to look for compliance violations like um, like secrets, potentially secrets that could be in the image um, or other um, misconfigured um, uh, file access controls. And then finally, it's kind of hard to see in one of the screenshots, but there's a little tab there called modules. Oh yeah, it's the bottom right one there, <laughs> modules. You know, Jen mentioned uh, the, the SBOM. Uh, and how critical it is, and there's an edict to keep track of all of the components of the uh, images you're using, the build components. So when an image is scanned, we're going to return the complete list of modules so that, and, and that can be turned into that SBOM format uh, for reporting purposes or logging purposes or comparing that to the approved SBOM list. Um, all of those things can be then integrated into the supply chain reporting aspects. Now, equally important, uh, it's kind of hard to see on the, the bottom left, is this is a, um, a CVE scanning report of all the images uh, that were in the registries as well as the runtime aspects. And here, not only are we able to report, you know, critical vulnerabilities, but we're able to show you where those are detected. So, and, and you know, with a red, black, and a green indicator, you know, show you if that we deem some of those as critical. Uh, and the reason is that these vulnerabilities could be an image in an image in your registry, but we don't find them running in production. So obviously they can't be exploited because they're actually not running. However, if they are running in production and you don't have the, the new vector runtime security controls put in place, they will show up as red because we've detected this is a critical vulnerability in a running container. We'll show you the deployment that, uh, and the pods that uh, contain that. And they'll be in red because you haven't turned on the new vector protections for runtime security. So if there was an exploit attempt and a successful exploit or expansion, you would not be protected in that environment. Green it represents uh, protected um, uh, um, containers or, or images in production uh, and black are not being used. So that's a way of thinking of tying your pipeline security environment to your runtime security environment. Next. <clears throat> 
And so I get to the, uh, the, the last topic I mentioned is, is really the gate between uh, the supply chain, the pipeline and the uh, production environment. And this is where it's critical to implement some form of admission controls. Admission controls uh, can and should be based on those scan results that we just did in the registry scan. So uh, if there are critical vulnerabilities, again, you can say only if there's a fix available, I'm gonna block that deployment because it should have been fixed in the pipeline. Uh, only if that was uh, discovered or as published more than seven days ago, because that gave my developers time to to remediate that in the pipeline. Um, if there are other things that uh, do have critical vulnerabilities, but there's no fix available, um, I can have labels on there that say, yes, this is authorized to deploy because I have runtime controls in place or it's not exploitable in my environment. So there's a way to accept or allow deployments into the runtime environment uh, based on a review of vulnerabilities. But in addition to scan results, which could include uh, vulnerability information, compliance uh, information, um, specific CVEs as well, um, you can also implement zero trust controls. And, and this is where this topic plays into the zero trust topic. Um, for example, you can limit the deployment to authorized registries. So again, you're implementing a zero trust control, which is to be, be declaring allowed and authorized registry sources uh, or labels or users and groups, rather than uh, trying to block um, uh, bad ones or allowing deployments from any registry. So the more you narrow the scope of the allowed behavior, the smaller the attack surface and the less chance that someone is going to be able to find a way into that environment. Uh, in addition to the, um, the live admission controls, you can also audit your deployment files before uh, they're deployed into the pipeline to see if they're going to pass all of your admission control checks and, um, and, and, and all of your compliance requirements. So you might say things like uh, in a deployment, and these might not be security related issues. They might just be compliance for running um, healthy workloads. You know, there must be um, resource um, limits uh, declared or requested in uh, files. There must be labels that identify the development or team owner of the image in order to be allowed to be deployed. So we know who to contact if there's an issue with this. So any of these can be live uh, enforced during the admission process or uh, audited prior to that to, to make sure they um, pass those requirements before they're even tried to be deployed. All right, so next slide, I think we're going to go on to Kube Warden, which is a extensible uh, framework to implement really more customizable admission control policies. Over to you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. So Kube Warden, um, we've talked about it quite frequently in the community. Um, it is a policy agent for Kubernetes. And um, and part of its mission is to simplify the adoption as policy as code. And how we do that is if we take some of the components of Kube Warden, the first one being the admission controller, we have our JSON object and we are attempting to send this through and we apply the business logic on top, our policy for that we want to apply to any object that comes through or even a particular object. And we have a few states that we can uh, apply to it. We can either accept it as is, we can reject it. If we didn't like what the policy, what the object had, we can um, all out reject it. And if we think about a policy like, um, you know, a particular naming convention, right? We can, you meet the requirements for it. We can accept it if you don't, we can reject it, but one of the powerful things that Kubeboard has is the ability to mutate particular objects to meet that standard. So 
um, instead of you know causing frustration with the team trying to do a deployment or make a, a modification to an object, we can mutate that particular object to come in line with the policy that we have. Now, one of the things that's really powerful with Kubeboard is we're able to validate the particular uh, object coming in, right? And we want to make sure that we um, either mutate the request, reject the request, or accept it as is, and then we can you know, log a particular error that we can come back and pick it up through logging for this emission control. And this is a bit of snippet of code from Rust explaining, you know, showing just that. Mutation, um, like I said before, is one of the powerful aspects that we have with Kubewarden, and this allows us to um, modify or mutate the request to match a particular policy that we have. And I gave the example of making sure that you have a particular name. Um, one of the things that um, I did a talk on is making sure you don't over provision a pod um, in Coop or container uh, for Coopboard. And we wrote a policy about that. We can extend that policy to say, hey, we want you to be within, you know, one or two particular CPUs or, you know, one to 10 CPUs, but we don't want you to go over 10, but we'll keep you in that range. Um, that's a uh, kind of a larger example, but that gives us the ability to change and modify the request to meet the policies that we have on the cluster. And that's the mutate request that you'll see that they're Policy configuration is allows us to set policies and via the configuration. And what this gives us the ability to do is if we match particular labels, we want to make sure that um, we can apply a policy based upon what that is. Now, we can do that via labels. We can do it by, um, via the type. But this is one of the uh, abilities of the configuration of the policy to match the particular object that you need to apply to. An awesome aspect of what Kubewarden can do is the um, reuse of known tools. And now this is um, the policy user group. This is in Kubewarden. Um, when we're writing policies, we actually can use Rust format and Clippy. These are all the same tools that any developer would use in their pipeline. We allow them to, it works just as well here in the pipeline to deploy your policy and put it into a container registry for that. As I said earlier, this integrates with uh, most CI CD platforms. I don't want to say all because I'm probably sure, I'm pretty sure that Simon will find one out there that it doesn't work for. But for the vast majority, these will work within the vast majority of CI CD pipelines. But I want to talk about why Kubernetes is uh, as powerful as it is, and uh, one of the aspects of it is WebAssembly modules, right? And it gives us the ability to build web assemblies in a multitude of languages um, from C all the way down to Swift. I prefer Rust. Next is its size. It's very, these are very, very small um, artifacts that we can deploy. And we can run pretty much anywhere. And I say that with an asterisk, um, but for the larger main systems that we're running on, and then for our example with Kubewarden, WebAssembly works amazing. Next is the security with it. We're memory safe. We're we're controlled. We can we maintain control flow integrity, and we have runtime isolation where each WebAssembly is running in its own particular sound sandbox on top of the host process. Another amazing thing about Kubewarden is OPA and gatekeeper policies um, can and can be built to run on top of it. So you don't have to rewrite your policies you should be, to use Kubewarden. You can actually use existing policies that are written in Rego. And to do that, you will take that Rego policy and you can do an OPA build, target WASM, and out spot, spits the policy that you need and you can deploy via container registry. So, so I talked about this earlier. Um, we have our OCI registry that we have, and then the policy server actually spins up a particular runtime to isolate each one of these 
policies that you deploy. So that's part of the aspect of that is that isolation that the policy server gives us. Now, this is uh, a, a, actually, this was, I want to say new to me, but I knew this was going on and the development team for Kuborn was working on it, but we're also starting to allow end users to verify the providence of the policies that they are writing. Um, and in a future instance, um, and I, I don't know where it's at in development, so don't ask me, um, but it's a good question for the Kuborn team, is to allow policy authors to leverage SIGSTOR for the primitives when they're writing policies. Um, and that's still in the works right now. I don't know where to the timeline of that and how deep they're gonna go with it on the atomic level for um, leveraging primitives. And within Kube Warden, you can um, set a specific issuer that you will accept Kube Warden policies from. And these are particularly signed. This is kind of the example here of that where we want them from particular um uh a github user content um for this example it's anyone from flavio's github <coughs> prefix we will take that and that is assigned and we accept that as policy now i'm going to turn this over to glenn because glenn can talk a little more about the roadmap between kube warden and new vectors future together so glenn if you would please sir sure Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm really excited about Kube Warden and especially the last thing he mentioned, which is um, using SIGSTOR to, to sign and verify signatures. Um, and that extends to images, being able to have signed images and to make that part of an admission control policy. So I, I know a lot of our customers really uh, like that feature and want that integrated. So uh, speaking of integration, um, we are planning uh, integration. Uh, the first phase is really new vector with Rancher. So in May, you'll see some Rancher integration, single sign-on RBAC, um, deployment ease integration capabilities. But, um, and then after that, uh, we're looking at the Kube Warden and new vector integration. So various uh, things to tackle in the first phase would be things like events and alerts. You know, when you see uh, when anything happens, whether that's an emission control event or an admin event, um, those can all show up in New Vector. We didn't do a demo today of New Vector, but you can integrate New Vector with your SIM system. So all your security events go out to your SIM system, whether that's a Splunk app or Syslog, web, uh, webhooks. Um, or um, you know, other ways to collect events. So that'll be a good consolidation of what's going on. Um, and then the next is um, logical thing would be to be able to see in one place all of your admission control rules so that you can evaluate them and make sure they're not overlapping or conflicting with each other. <clears throat> uh, and then in the future, we're also entertaining other ideas of Kube Warden um, uh, configuration ability for new vector rules or vice versa. In new vector, you can uh, configure some of the Kube Warden policies as well. Um, generally, I, th I think this is a really exciting area because uh, these are two very complementary solutions. Kube Warden is more extensible and customizable and you can extend it to uh, larger policy management frameworks like OPA and using Rego. Um, those are all things that are going to benefit uh, both the Kube Warden and the new vector uh, security rules as well to be able to start to manage those uh, together. Uh, but if you do have ideas uh, and suggestions for uh, the roadmap of either one of these products independently or together, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And um, our open source, um, uh, the, the source code of New Vector is on this GitHub link. Um, there's a couple rancher Slack channels that uh, can engage as a Kube Warden Slack channel, as well as a um, New Vector Dash security uh, Slack channel on the rancher users um, uh, uh, Slack. So love to hear from you on that. A uh, couple more things uh, next, Robert, before we take some questions. 
So we've talked about supply chain and pipeline security. Um, I would like to throw in a kind of an opinion here, which is really, you know, all this kind of scanning and preventing of things to uh, before um, you run in production to try to make sure bad stuff doesn't get into your production environment. It's kind of looking in the rearview mirror, right? You're looking for known published CVEs or um, looking for uh, bad activity that um, you've identified could happen. However, <laughs> um, uh, like zero day attacks um, are attacks uh, where nobody has really seen these types of attacks in the wild. So hackers are always looking for new and innovative ways to get into your infrastructure. And that's why we have the importance of things like runtime controls, including traffic inspection, getting real time views of the live traffic in your environment so you can detect uh, attacks and, and actually block them while they're in process. And as an example of that, I wanted to take the uh, recent Log4j vulnerability and just uh, kind of break that down in terms of the various security perspectives. Uh, next slide, Robert. <clears throat> so this is a summary. Um, we actually did a Log4j uh, webinar a few months ago and broke this down in more detail. Um, but if you think about Log4j, you know, there's a vulnerability exploit, which results in a remote code execution, um, connection to LDAP servers and command and control servers. And then once that happens, anything can happen, malware, ransomware, crypto mining, or even stealing sensitive data. Um, now let's take the situation before Log4j was even disclosed and nobody knew about it. That would be day zero before the CVE. Um, if you had zero trust network process and file protections protecting your workloads, so only allowed connections between your workloads uh, verified by the protocol in place, as well as um, only allowed process and file activity in each workload was uh, clearly defined, as well as strict egress controls. Which workloads are allowed to connect outside this Kubernetes cluster? Where are they allowed to connect to by IP address, uh, subnet, or uh, DNS name? And what protocol are they allowed to be using? Um, you could have detected and prevented an attempted log4j exploit even before it was disclosed. And that is true for uh, most zero-day attacks as well. Uh, so, the, so the most critical thing to protect your environment it, is really these types of runtime controls. Now, if we take uh, day one plus after log4j was disclosed, in the runtime environment, you would have wanted to do several things. Uh, the first is to define, uh, we immediately came out with a WAF rule that could detect an attempted exploit. So that could be implemented so that uh, if you had uh, workloads that had that vulnerability, you could detect an attempted uh, exploit. Uh, you could do things like automated quarantine, and then you could put in place admission control rules to prevent further deployments of the log4j vulnerability. And then in addition to that, you would go back into the pipeline and say, okay, are there any images in my registry um, or, or in my runtime environment that contain that vulnerability? Let me go back and send those back through the build pipeline uh, to be remediated. Remember that uh, as this was unfolding, not only was there an initial CVE, but there was a series of CVEs. So after that, it was discovered that that first fixed version did not completely patch that vulnerability. So there was another CVE issued. So over the course of seven to 10 days, there, was, there were two other CVEs. So you're constantly having to go back and remediate and put things back through that pipeline. Uh, find those vulnerable images, rebuild them, scan them again, and then put those admission control rules in place so that uh, anything that somehow bypasses your build scans and registry scans can be blocked from a deployment. So that's how you would really implement all of these supply chain as well as zero trust controls uh, using log4j as an example. 
All right, I think that's uh, all we had for today. Oh, uh, a little plug. I've been plugging the runtime security um, uh, masterclass, which is a week from today. So be sure to sign up for that. Uh, Tracy Walker will be talking about uh, the runtime controls that I talked about, uh, and, and as well as how to automate all of that in your environment. So we'd love to see if uh, there are any questions. Uh, I think I already answered one um, uh, that uh, somebody has deployed new vector, but not all the features are showing up. In the 4.x version, um, there's uh, a license required, but the open source version, which you can find the docs at uh, open-docs.newvector.com. Uh, as well as on that GitHub link, uh, new vector slash new vector GitHub link, um, you will find the source code as well as instructions to the Docker Hub. So that does not require a license key. Do new vector and Kubernetes play nice together? Yes, they do. However, they could play nicer together with that integration that I talked about. Um, if you're familiar with admission controllers, you can have a series of admission controllers. Um, and so depending on uh, how they're implemented, when they're implemented, the one of the admission controllers, whether it's new vector that takes place and runs through its rules, blocks if needed, then it would go to the next admission controller, let's say Kubeborden or vice versa. And then uh, those policies would be evaluated. Um, one of the benefits of Kubeborden is that it's a mutating admission controller was new vector is really just uh, more of a static uh, admission controller. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, um, what is the best practice to deploy new vector for um, Kubernetes clusters that are managed by Rancher? So uh, do we uh, deploy via Rancher apps uh, or new vector Helm chart? All of the above uh, can be done and, and are supported. There's a new vector Helm chart available. Um, new vector is listed in the uh, Rancher catalog through the console. And with the uh, 5.0 GA release of both Rancher 265 and New Vector 5 in May uh, next month, uh, you will be able to deploy New Vector through Rancher through Rancher charts. And um, we do, and then you, once you deploy New Vector through Rancher, you'll be able to log in to the New Vector console uh, through Rancher. So if you're an admin for that cluster in Rancher, you can then go through to New Vector without having to re-log in to New Vector. So there's a lot of great uh, integration we're starting and we'll continue to um, uh, include. Uh, somebody wants to see a live demo. Yeah, in, uh, in other master classes and webinars, we've done live demos. So uh, either check those for recording, um, uh, the past ones that I've done. Uh, next week, Tracy will be showing a live demo of um, the zero trust controls. So uh, you can tune into that as well. <clears throat> I believe that's all of our questions. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, Robert, any final words? Yes, if you haven't signed up for community.suitsu.com, there's the community link right below. It's that green button that kind of shimmers at the bottom. Um, click on that, continue the conversation. You can also sign up for our next um, security masterclass that you see. Um, if you don't want to, can't remember that big long URL there, this recording is re recorded. Um, so you guys can come back here to Crowdcast and watch it. Um, but I want to thank you, Glenn. I know Jen jumped off. And for everybody else, thank you. And we'll see you in the community. All right. Take care, everyone.